Welcome to Field Sports Britain, coming to you this week from a grouse moor in Cumbria. Coming up, hole in one. Roy Lupton's out on a golf course to see if he can do that to a fox. First, destruction test. We put Dom Holtham against a pair of Zeiss binoculars and see who cracks first. So we got a copy of Passion magazine in the office the other day, and in it was a story about how the guys from Zeiss tried to destruction test one of their Conquest HD binoculars. The kind of thing that might go wrong in the field. Dropping them from a high seat, running over them with a 4x4. They even shot the binoculars and they still survive. But can that really be true? Actually it works, take a look. So these, these are still crystal clear. The focus wheel works, a little bit gritty. But people would probably consider, you know, it's a precision optical instrument. They're going to think that they're actually, they're not capable of putting up with this kind of punishment. Yeah, we were surprised as well, to be honest. So to shoot, to shoot at it was uh, our last torture and it, and it was no problem, actually. The, the shot pellets, they got stuck in the, in the rubber surface, but that was it. So yeah. we were surprised as well. Okay, you work in marketing. You're bound to say nice <laughs> things about your own product. So we've come over to find out whether or not you're they really are as tough as you say. You're absolutely welcome to test it on your own. So we are prepared and uh, we got a bino, so go okay. for it. Yeah, this is uh, your victim for today, so do me one favor, please don't be gentle. So I'll try, uh, I'll you try. Will, I'm sure. So here we are then, kid at Christmas time with my factory fresh boxed Conquest HD binoculars worth about a thousand euros and uh, apparently I've got to try and break them. Not looking forward to this. Take it out of the box, Tom! <laughs> well, the, the box is pretty sturdy but uh, apparently I'm not going to get away with it that easily. It just feels so wrong to take something which normally we'd be cherishing and looking after and taking good care of to last us a lifetime and to treat it like this. I know what you're thinking. How likely is it that you're going to drop your binoculars from the high seat? Well, actually, it's surprisingly easy. Oh, four. The things you see. So, test one complete. I've chucked these things out of that high stand 20 times for various shots and uh, so far, so good. The eye cups are still working. Focus wheel is still working. I think we're gonna have to try a bit harder. So we're just gonna stop for a quick lunch break now. We're gonna wait for the Zeiss guys to come and join us. Give the binoculars a bit of a rest. Just gonna put them here out of the way. Then I think, oh, time for a quick bite to eat. So we haven't really made much of an impression on these yet. No, not at all. Um, and to be fair, a bit of fun that was, but it, it wasn't a real test because there's some fairly serious packaging in there, lots of padding, big cardboard box. But what kind of scenario are we hoping to recreate now? You are on a rush, you need to be back home early, you drop them off your pocket or just out of the backpack and you keep on going and you simply roll over it with your 4x4. Okay. This is the situation which can happen and uh, well, let's do so. If you don't trust us running over it in a box, we do it without. No worries. Okay, and we've got a 1.7 ton Isuzu D-Max, which is Rudiger's uh, personal vehicle. And we're not, we're not on soft mud here, are we? This is a rock hard track, so that this is going to be taking the full weight of the vehicle. Yes. Okay, So let's do it. I get behind the steering wheel and you give me instructions. This is going to break my heart to do this, but let's find out if it breaks the binoculars. Keep going. Keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. A bit more. Stop. I think it's safe to say they're squashed. Hmm, I 
they were fairly comprehensively crushed by that. We've got lots of uh, lots of dust, lots of tie marks, but the the hinge still works perfectly. The eye cup still worked perfectly. The focus wheel still works perfectly. There's a little bit of resistance about there. Let's see what they look like through the lens. Crystal. The only, the only thing I can feel that's different to when they were brand new out of the box is there's a now a slight stiffness in the focus wheel. But other than that, pretty much perfect. So it's one thing putting them on the floor and running them over, but what happens if you leave them on the roof of your truck and they get clattered down the road? Okay, so we've got, we've got a few signs of minor physical damage now. Got a bit of chip into the uh, to the metalwork here, and this uh, this little plastic bit on the side, which is where your strap would go, that's been crushed. But still, we've got a little bit of stiffness in that eye cup. Still works. That one feels fine. Diaper adjustment's fine. Focus wheel is fine. Optics are pin sharp. Got to try harder. Okay, so now we're going to try and simulate a lifetime of crawling through the undergrowth, having it hanging from your neck, dangling on the rocks. We obviously haven't got a lifetime to do it, so we're going to try and simulate that in about 10 seconds with the help of a rope and a pickup truck. safe to say they are now showing some signs of wear um, but then they have just done about a kilometer up this tarmac forest track at speeds up to about 40 kilometers an hour which is pretty serious let's let's be honest and like they say this is not a mud track um, we've got some issues now with the eye cups you know that they're feeling a little bit stiff doctor adjustment still working focus wheel is still working and okay I've got a bit of dust on the lens but I can still see okay through them they're still sharp I can still focus still work. I can't actually believe that do you treat your binoculars like this it's very nice very nice very good Point. bit of slobber but uh, I think we need to check their waterproofing capabilities a little bit more seriously than a bit of spit. We found this lovely tranquil fishing lake in the forest apparently it's very good there's carp, zander, pike in here. Um, sadly we haven't bought any fishing gear but we are going to give the uh, give the conquest a swim see if we can clean them up a bit and find out whether or not they still retain their waterproof properties so uh, here we go not liking how much gas is coming up. <laughs> okay, let's see if we've got a bite. I reckon they've survived that. Try again. Oh, no water inside. Clear picture. Focus wheel is working. Works. <laughs> and they're a bit cleaner now. <laughs> now they are clean actually. That's good. <laughs> Yet another test passed with flying colours. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So we've put these binoculars through a right hammering so far today. And when the Zeiss guys originally did the story, they found, as we have found today, that even though they punished them incredibly hard, the binoculars still survived. So they thought, what can we do which is above and beyond the Call of Duty? So they actually decided to shoot the binocular. It's not something we'd recommend you try at home, but uh, we've got a selection of hunting cartridges here. We've got our trusty binoculars that are still going strong. And we're going to blast them. Let's go. Have fun. Your protection. 
Safety glasses, shot check. Talent. <laughs> We're going to start with a uh, Rot Vile Steel game, number four, and move our way up from there. <laughs> I think if, if it was a pigeon, it'd be looking a bit secondhand. No broken glass. The uh, focus wheel still works despite having a pellet in it. Right, let's shoot it again. Take two. Okay, so we're, we're going we're to step up to a pokier cartridge. This is a number three. Weidmann's high or high velocity, traditional German hunting cartridge. This packs a fair bit of bump, apparently. So uh, the number four steel wasn't gutsy enough. Hopefully this one will, uh, this one will do the business. Okay, so here's the wad. So that made it to the target. The binoculars have been blown off the stump. Wow, well, so we've had a direct hit on the hinge here. No sign of breakage on the glass, but an awful lot more shots on the thing. I actually think we're gonna need for, to go for something a little bit more heavy duty even than this. Yeah, and have you got any explosives? When you did this, this isn't part of your normal test program, is it? So no, you, definitely you didn't not. know what no. the result was going to be. No, no, no. definitely not. No. No. It's That's why well, the testing got worse and worse, you know. In the end, we I ended mean, up shooting on it because we had no clue what to do. So you kind <laughs> of it, it. It taken everything that you thought could happen in the real world exactly, exactly. Yes. and survived. Yes. So you kind of had to get more extreme and more creative yes. in, in ways to try and destroy the product. Exactly, that was the idea. So, so I guess the idea for you guys is, is to make people understand the level of engineering that goes into a Zeiss product and just how tough they are in, in the real world. Especially in comparison to other low price binoculars. So this stuff for a thousand euro more or less can stand way more than anything else in that price range. So yeah. and we are very proud of it. It's, it's, it's good to know that uh, we survived once again. So it's a question of people reassessing what they're actually buying here. They're not, they're not buying it for this year or for next year. They're for buying generations, it. actually. Yeah, yes. for generations. And I, I do have one question, though. If somebody brings in a binocular to the Zeiss customer service department with shotgun pellets on, <laughs> what, what do you say? <laughs> well, the clear message of all uh, what happened today is don't try this at home. So don't try this at home. As shooting journalists, we get sent an awful lot of kit during the course of a year. And we do test it in the field. We take it out shooting, we get it wet, we get it muddy, but ultimately we have to show a bit of respect and we have to send it back. So it's been a fairly unique experience to be given a top end binocular and been told to go out and try to destroy it. And obviously there's a serious message in there somewhere about their faith in the product and the level of engineering that goes into one of these bits of kit. But let's also be honest, it was a lot of fun. Bring on the bangs. Well, Zeiss have kindly donated those binoculars to us and we are auctioning them for charity on eBay. If you would like them, they come with no warranty and a delightful stippled effect from the shot pellets in them. Search eBay for Zeiss Conquest HT Destruction Test and the link should be appearing on the screen. This is Field Sports Britain News. The head of the Church of England is a reasonable shot, according to Lambeth Palace. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr Justin Welby, went on a pheasant shoot in the mid-80s and recently went clay pigeon shooting while visiting Texas for a meeting of the American House of Bishops. Dr Welby recently turned down the offer of becoming a patron of the RSPCA, which many believe has given up its role as an animal welfare charity in order to campaign for animal rights. Would you like to try wild fowling in the UK? Well, opportunity knocks. The best place to look is the Basque Wild Fowling Permit Scheme booklet for 2013-2014. Basque members who want to give it a go or even experienced wild fowlers who want to find new shooting opportunities can get the booklet from the organisation. We use the scheme to go shooting with the Grange Wild Fowlers in Cumbria. Click on the link on the screen to watch the film. The Antis at last have a conviction against a real live hunt under the UK ban on hunting with hounds. 
Up to now, almost everyone convicted under the Hunting Act could also have been convicted under poaching laws. Members of the Middleton Hunt in Yorkshire admitted they'd let hounds catch a fox instead of shooting it. Three men were fined between £100 and £200, each with a £20 surcharge and £85 costs. You can earn serious money as a pro angler on the US competition circuit. Over four days, Randall Tharp of Port St. Joe, Florida, caught 20 bass weighing 53 pounds to win half a million dollars in the Forestwood Cup, sponsored by Walmart. Second prize of just $75,000 went to reigning champion Jacob Wheeler of Indianapolis. He had 20 bass weighing 49 pounds. And finally, it was two mares versus one salmon at a recent fishing competition in Canada. The 92-year-old mayor of Mississauga, Hazel McCallion, hooked a 16-pound Chinook salmon during the Great Ontario Salmon Derby. Toronto Mayor Rob Ford stepped in to save the day after the tiny mare was nearly yanked into the waters by the big fish. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David, and don't forget Roy is shooting foxes later in the programme. In the meantime, it's Hello Charlie. Here's what the world's up to this week. Hello Charlie. Hello Charlie. Day on the pigeons over a standing wheat crop. This is this is our bag, 123 pigeons. Bye Charlie. Bye Charlie. Hello Charlie. Hello Charlie. Me and my mate Russ are on a peace double field in Kent. Hoping for a good day on the pigeons. Hello Charlie. Hello Charlie. We're coming to you today from a very hot and sunny France where we've been fly fishing for black bass for the last two weeks. Just like this one. Au revoir, Au revoir Charlie. Charlie. Hello Charlie, I'm out hunting with my dad and my dad's hard. Hello Charlie, I'm out here in my husband's hard waiting for the ducks to come in. Go. Hello Charlie, this is Woody the Wood Pigeon. I'm a test pilot for Flightline Decoys and today we're going to be looking at the new FF4 to see what it looks like from above powering the Silosox Hyper Flapper. Hold on! You can do a Hello Charlie just now, Dad. Send us your own Hello Charlie. Film yourself on your mobile phone. Just a sentence saying Hello Charlie, who you are and what you're up to. Then share it or email it via YouTube, Facebook, Dropbox or you send it, you name it, to charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Thank you for those. Keep them coming. Now, golf might seem terribly sedate, but even golf courses have vermin problems. Roy Lupton's out foxing on the fairways. It's going to be tough to keep the golfing references to a minimum, but we'll try. Well-known falconer Roy has left his birdies at home. Well, the eagle anyway, so we can knock some holes in the local fox population. They're making a right mess of the greens, fairways and the benches, and it's Roy's job to clean it up. Many people would think that if you've got a golf course, you'd want as many foxes as you can possibly get to keep the rabbit population down. But in actual fact, the foxes can still cause a lot of damage by digging up the greens, defecating all over the place, um, and they are actually jumping up on the benches and uh, pooing all over the benches as well. So not ideal for a nice day out with your clubs. Personally, that really wouldn't bother me because golf is certainly not my game and I, I really don't quite understand it. But um, we'll kick off and end up at the 19th hole, old chap. We start with the front nine holes. We all have to be careful not to make more mess than the foxes, so we drag along Darren and his gator. We had wanted to have some fun in the golf buggies, but they charge up overnight and the club doesn't want members cutting up rough in the morning about flat batteries. Cutting up rough, see what we did there? The foxes shouldn't be lamp shy, so we've got a couple of Nightmaster 800s with the red and green LEDs. The beam travels as far as we can see, but unfortunately we don't see much. A couple of likely spots deliver nothing. The champion bogeys holes one, two and three. The Western River's call is taking the strain again tonight and finally a fox takes the bait, but only as we start to move off. There are actually two of them around and with the call already back in the gator, Roy uses the silver fox call. 
It's hard work, but a shot presents itself and our evening suddenly starts waking up. We just come over the top of the rise and we've just seen a fox disappear into the wood here. Um, he came out at the bottom, but as soon as the lamp was on him, he tucked back in and then he was starting to work his way back up across, but uh, luckily he stopped just long enough for us to get the shot. So we know there's another fox that came into our right hand side just above us. I'm hoping he's just worked his way over the other side of the course and we'll hopefully catch up with him in a second. For our next stand, Roy mixes it up a bit and starts with the mouth call. Lo and behold, a fox pops out for a look and Roy has his chance. Yeah, it changed axis. We reverted straight to the mouth call um, and straight away we got a fantastic response. Uh, just came straight out of that wood there. So, number two in the bag. And I think that's what we might do. We'll uh, just have a, a bit of a trawl around and try with a few more mouth squeaks and see how we get on. I'll just carry on for a second just in case. Sometimes one call works, other times another call works. You just never know. So it's always worth just having run through because we'd actually called previously in this spot and gone through a whole plethora of different calls on the electronic caller to no avail. Um, but I really thought this area was quite foxy. So I just wanted to give it another go and we gave it another go with one of the mouth callers and all of a sudden everything started to happen within a few seconds. So. Yeah, you've just got to always change your tactics and just be prepared to sort of change off the course of, uh, of what you decided to do and experiment a little bit. Another night, it could have been one of the calls on the electronic caller that worked, so you just never know. And that's, that's what's fun about it, because all of a sudden the action just kicks off and within seconds we've got two more foxes in the bag. So. Darren retrieves the foxes. Once again, they are adults. So where we are on this site here, we're actually surrounded quite heavily by um, housing. And by the looks of it, those foxes are not um, our normal customers that we'd find in the fields and what have you. They definitely look a little bit uh, more urban. The conditions are nowhere near as nice. Um, the fur conditions not as good. But the most interesting thing so far is we haven't even seen a cub. It'll be interesting to see what goes on once we've had the harvest. Cub, whereas normally, when we're doing that sort of squeaking at this time of year, we'd be getting an awful lot of interest from young cubs coming about. Are you wearing guy liner? Guy liner. Does it look like I'm wearing guy liner? Does it? Thank you, darling. Does it mean I'm looking incredibly handsome tonight? <laughs> a bit further down the fairway, we spot a fox in the scrub. Roy sticks with what he knows and lets loose with the mouth call. From hundreds of metres away, the telltale eyes come bobbing towards us. This one needs a bit more careful management. Finally, Roy is happy with the shot. A little bit puckered. Oh, it's certainly turning on now. The, uh, that wasn't the original fox that we saw, but it just came over the rise and there was a fox sitting right out in the middle of the green there, but he disappeared off and uh, just tried to call that one out. And we're probably not more than about 150, 200 yards from where we were calling a minute ago where we had the other two and carried on calling for a little while. And another one started coming in from probably a good 500 yards away. The last little bit, he wasn't quite sure because I think where we are sitting on the top of the bug at the moment, we're a bit skyline. So when he got really close, he uh, he panicked a little bit and went back a touch, but uh, just managed to pick him out in the trees there. So I think the way we're going now, we could start to build up a reasonable bag. What are the teeth like? Worn out? No, no, she's not an overly old Charlie. Certainly not a youngster though. In the words of John Paul Sartre, as anyone who has seen Caddyshack knows, au revoir, Foxy. We're now on a charge. The next hole delivers a youngster. Soon followed by another. Roy has to work this second fox harder by using a more delicate touch.
we knew that we had a, a questionable backstop calling with that wood to our right, we were hoping the foxes were going to come from the wood to our left. So we just carried on squeaking. I actually changed the squeak. I've really toned it down. So we went to um, a little mouth squeaker from Best Fox Call, which is, um, a, well, I think it's a willow grouse call. And that was just enough to regain its interest as it was sitting there. And luckily, instead of coming or you know following the contour of the wood, it decided to come out to the left. So again, we had a fantastic backstop on that one because we've got rising ground there. So uh, again, no more than 40, 50 yards off and perfect shot. Yeah, put them both together. No, I want to tell youngsters, yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah, dog and a vixen from the same litter. As we travel to our final hole, Roy explains the need for the Nightmasters. It's just a, a lot quicker. You can cover the ground, have a good scan about, see what you've got. It allowed us to get a good number of foxes relatively quickly. And now we know pretty much where the foxes are that are lamp shy. We can come back with the night vision and then clear those up another night. Our last customer is another long play. The fox comes from the woodland on the far edge. Before it's too close, Roy knocks it over. After a slow start, it's been a really satisfying night with some lovely shots from the rough and across the green. Nicely putt. Putt, put, get it. That's the old Lupton magic there, and you can see more of it on the screen that's appeared up there. If you click on that, go straight through to the Lupton video collection. And if you want to get in touch with Roy, you can contact him on Facebook. He has finally joined and he's amassing more friends than Mark Gilchrist. No, it's not possible. Or you can email him, Roy at fieldsportschannel.tv. Next, we're off to the wider world of hunting, shooting and fishing on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. You can be a hotshot North American hunter if you sell an iPhone app these days, and that's why it's a pleasure to see Cody Draper from RacksSight.com in New Zealand after big red stag, bull tar, and even a 500 yard shot on a roo. Take that 500 yards, multiply it by three, and you get this remarkable shot, which claims to be the longest coyote shot on video. At first, he thinks it's a clean miss, but the 338 Lapua Magnum does its work. There are lots of crossovers between shooting and painting, both are right side brain activities, both can take you to wild places. With the wild fowling season around the corner, renowned wildlife artist Jonathan Pomroy talks about the paintings he produced for the 2013 Wildlife Habitat Trust stamp. You can purchase the stamps and even full size prints of the work from the WHT website whtorguk and help keep Britain's extremities extreme. We stay in the British Isles for our first fishing outing this week, salmon fishing are Ireland 2013 shows Mr Kingfisher 3 catching a salmon on the fly one evening. I am getting reports that Irish rivers are stuffed with salmon this August and I'm off there soon. I can't wait. Other Brits travel to France for their fishing. French carp fishing holiday to saint Amand leisure shows Brits abroad on a French lake where carp topping £40 are caught using traditional British techniques of steamies pop-ups over a wide spread of steamed boilies glugged in oils. Sounds yummy. Now an instructional film from one of the UK Case prodigies, gamekeeper John is here showing some catapult practice techniques. If, like me, you keep a slingshot in your pocket for emergencies, this will be useful. Less useful in the UK because our government doesn't allow it is bowhunting.com's YouTube channel. We have to go abroad for it, and while we're waiting to do that, it's a great channel for US bow hunting action. Lots of yeehaw twang fft. And finally, we join a Brit who is abroad enjoying driven boar in Serbia. It is A1 Decoys, which runs two, three, and four day trips at prices starting from £2,000 with no trophy fees. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, we are back next week and if you're watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's somewhere around the outside of the screen or go to our webpage fieldsportschannel.tv where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or scroll down to the bottom of the page, pop your email address into our constant contact form and we'll constantly contact you with news about our programme which is out 7pm every Wednesday UK time. From a windswept moor in Cumbria, this has been Field Sports Britain.